let's say the, the best way to understand what goes wrong with people trying to understand uh, or trying to not understand value ontology is uh, best is um, uh, uh, Wittgenstein explains it. He doesn't explain it trying to explain it. He explains it trying to uh, you know solve the philosophical problems of the world and actually initially he thinks he has uh, done what he set out to do but then he realizes oh no I just explicated explicated the most common mistake or the sort of the like the foundational mistake of uh, analytical philosophy now this mistake which he realized and spent his, the rest of his life on to sort of address is the superstition about language it is the still widely held idea uh, or it's more than an idea it's, it's an instinct that language that uh, is sort of pre-made that a word like for example value you can just look it up in the dictionary and that's it then you'll just know all about it what it what it means but let me you know sort of let you in on a secret um, since you know there is no God he uh, there is no God that could have written the dictionary the dictionary is actually uh, human made and another secret is that humans do not possess at least that I know of uh, an absolute understanding of, of um, themselves or the means to which uh, the ways in which they relate to uh, the world and themselves and I'm talking about of course about language so think about that moment you start to sort of wonder how words came to be and how grammar came to be and how one word got to be a verb and the other one a noun and some words many words being able to be both verb and noun and what is a verb and what's a noun and and when did the difference actually come to be and why are verbs also nouns and etc etc et if you start to think about that then you start to um, you know, scratch on the door of philosophy. That's what Wittgenstein was doing the rest of his life, scratching on that door. Nietzsche, you just, that's, that's a philosopher. He was born with, it seems, the power to directly understand when he, that what he read came out of a human, well, sorry, came out of a human being and not out of, uh, out of God. <laughs> but, you know, people generally aren't as talented at philosophy as Friedrich Nietzsche. So, I don't know, this is it's surreal. It's surreal that things have been understood for so long and yet it just it doesn't seem it doesn't seem to make a difference people seem to but that's what I said it's it's not an idea it's an instinct you cannot really you cannot teach instinct and neither can you destroy them so or you can I suppose you can by very very severe means but not like not really in writing right you have to address instinct so that's what what we as a clan are try, trying to do and actually doing because uh, the preparation has been long enough 15 years and I know how to handle you know some basic stuff now um, what we're trying to do is uh, doing is um, let's say projecting the proper instinct so that people who actually have that instinct in them uh, receive this as an invitation and as a sort of an encouragement to start uh, using that instinct start to think and by thinking 
this is also where I, where all the analytical philosophers and all the sort of cognitive, um, I don't know, brain science philosophers are completely in the dark still. It's not true that we start to think using words. Usually I think without any words. I can think with geometrical shapes, I can think with sounds, I can think with images, I can think with emotions, and I can think with lots of things that we don't even have words for. Very rarely, well not very, probably half the time actually, I think in words. But it's absolutely untrue that we require these uh, absolutely um, quite random things like words, which also mean all sorts of different things in different languages, to uh, form conceptions of uh, our own being and of, of our, I mean, of our own experiences. And these conceptions, as soon as we are starting to compare two different conceptions, like for example a triangle and a, a square, then we are, and uh, then we're thinking. And as you can see by this example, comparing a triangle to a square, the, the actual thought that is caused by this isn't really easy to uh, explicate beyond setting the conditions, like trying, uh, that which a triangle and a square have in common. This could be a lot, a lot of things. And as soon as you start to, you know, produce them, these things, then you're thinking. Well, the same is with, well, with philosophy. What, what I'm doing is taking one word uh, and comparing it to the, let's say, the other words that formally mean the same thing. But then we find out actually they do not, not mean the same thing at all. And within this dynamism of, the, of sort of, you know, shaking loose the, the meaning of, from the words, we get this whole sort of mass of meaning in our hands and we're able to attribute it anew to, to the words so that we can actually properly separate the words from each other in terms of their meaning. What I'm saying is that largely the task of philosophy is to uh, complete language or to make sure that language makes sense. So this is why, and language did not make sense because um, it just didn't have any notion of itself. It didn't know what it was doing when it was saying, speaking a words. It, 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 it thought, and it, well, the humans using it thought, that, as I said, it was created by God or came out of the heavens, meaning everything, like Wittgenstein thought, or should, you know, that's how we should approach it. But Nietzsche find out, found out, or actually, uh, actually was the first to uh, formally explicate that the meaning of that language has uh, is still very rough, very organic, very much just a projection of the will of the one who speaks and the one who reads. So to unite the speaker and the reader, this is, uh, well, this is what I would call philosophical reading, reading behind behind the sentence, behind the words, into what is actually, uh, what is actually expressed. And, well, if we are in that, operating in that terrain, there's no getting around valuing. That's basically what happens behind the words. So value ontology operates on a level below language or above language or deeper inside language and you have to learn to read again in order to you have to unlearn your fucking superstitions unlearn your wittgensteinian belief or your early wittgensteinian belief because he spent the rest of his life saying okay that didn't quite make sense um unlearn that and um, then you'll discover a much larger realm within your cognitive uh self which is completely unexplored and which actually can uh, use language to actually enforce change. As you see, I have done. I mean, you can hate me, whatever you want, but you can see my influence um, and how gripping that influence is, e even to people who really hate it, or maybe especially.
not especially because the ones who love it love it are of course um, equally or even more dedicated but using language in a way value ontology uh, allows you to use it just brings you infinitely more power than you'll ever have uh, you know deliberately trying to sort of flatten language in some sort of um, truth table that doesn't work now So this is why I'm always struggling with this, um, with this anger. Because uh, it's essentially, oh, this, it's this very ancient cowardice that wants to reduce things to be more simple than they are. This, it's this very cowardice that destroys so, so many humans. And it's not like, it's not something I can just sit, you know, sit back and watch and think all oh, these poor suckers no i it actually it actually hurts it's actually really really nasty to perceive so yeah i do think my uh like most prominent like opponents or enemies uh let's say enemies are fundamentally cowardice uh, cowardly in their composure, in their comportment. Because they're smart enough to, uh, uh, to understand it, I think. But uh, as I said, that's, that's, never, that's almost never the issue. Instinct is the issue, and cowardice is an instinct. So, as much as I'm, 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 I'm talking and explaining, I could never change that instinct. Uh, and that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to show to the people who do not, are not ruled by the instinct of, uh, of cowardice, to stop sort of revering cowardice. It's not, <laughs> you know, it's not just that it's ugly and stupid and weak. It's also that it won't bring you anywhere. Like, if you continue on this path of cowardice, you'll find yourself in 20 years to have just to f basically have grown very annoyed with your previous wannabe philosophical self, realizing, well, that didn't bring you anything, like Wittgenstein realized, even, with, even he realized. Whereas, um, as you uh, people aren't realizing yet, and I can't blame them for that because this cowardice and this resulting weakness of philosophy has been so pervasive that people are just not aware of uh, other possibilities. But if you, but I, well, can guarantee that there is another possibility. I guarantee that there is uh, power in the proper approaching of uh, of words. With proper just means uh, strong just means that uh, you don't let yourself be led by, uh, well, the will to, um, the will for things to just fall into their place by themselves without you having to do anything about that. If you relinquish this passive old nanny, old grandpa on the porch mentality, well, then you'll still have to do the work, but you know, the work becomes available for you to do. And it's glorious work. The whole universe itself is uh, basically nothing but glorious work. And all that falls away is just what's not as glorious. There's value ontology.